gosh, this is horrendous. I've never seen anything like this. I tried to build a robotic Rubik's Cube that can solve itself, but instead, all I ended up with was this blob of 3D printing filament. Hi everyone, my name is Zach. If you're like me, you have creative ideas and sometimes they get trapped inside your head. Here on Bite Size Engineering, I make ridiculous engineering projects and I'm all about inspiring you to unleash your inner maker. In this video, I'm gonna be building a Rubik's Cube, but this is no ordinary Rubik's Cube because once you scramble this puzzle, you can set it down and it will unscramble itself and get back to the original state. There are several different design considerations when doing this project. The first thing I need to figure out is how to control the sides of the Rubik's Cube so that they can move by themselves. So obviously I'm gonna need some sort of motor. There are several different options of motors that I could use. I could use a servo motor, or I could use a brushless motor, or even just a regular old DC motor. But the problem is I need to know the position of the motor as it spins around, otherwise I'm not gonna be able to bring it back to the starting position. So I'm going to need some sort of positional feedback on the motor to tell me exactly where it is. I did some digging around and I found these little DC motors on Amazon. On the back here, there's an encoder built right into the motor. So this is really good because it has a couple of Hall effect sensors and a little wheel that has magnets on it. So as the wheel turns, it detects the position and it'll send back little signals to tell me exactly the position that the motor's in. So I need six of these motors because the Rubik's Cube has six sides. If you've studied a Rubik's Cube, you'll notice that it's actually just the centerpieces on all sides that rotate and that's what scrambles the Rubik's Cube. So all I need to do is be able to control those center rotating pieces. Now that I have the motor selected, I'm gonna jump on the computer and start designing this in CAD. To start this design, I need to figure out how to hold all six motors in the positions that they need to be in. So two of the motors need to be in the x-axis, two of the motors need to be pointing opposite in the y-axis, and two of the motors, if I can bend my hands like that, two of the motors need to be bending and in the z-axis. So I need to figure out how to hold those motors in those positions. My first attempt was kind of a failure. I thought that a cube would be the best design and that I'd be able to hold all six motors in the positions that they needed to be by replicating the cube, but I think that's gonna take up too much space and it's just gonna interfere with all the parts that are moving around. So the better way that I found to do this was to create sort of six spokes that point out from the center point of the cube. This way I can have all six motors mounted in the way that they need to be mounted and then not have any interference with the cube parts. As I design complex parts like this, I'm always thinking about how I'm gonna 3D print this on a print bed. So in this case, this is a pretty complex part that has a lot of different surfaces that are going in different directions. And so I found it best to actually split the body in half and then I'm gonna 3D print this in two parts and then screw them back together when I assemble it. My original plan was to design all of the moving parts for the Rubik's Cube in Fusion 360 myself. But after I did a little bit of digging, I found that one of my favorite 3D printing channels called Maker's Muse has done a lot of the work for me. If you don't know about Angus and Maker's Muse, he does a lot of cool 3D printing tips and a lot of industrial design, and it's just a really good channel to go check out. A while back, he started creating these twisty puzzles like Rubik's Cubes, but he started doing them in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And in order to streamline the process, he created a solid model in Fusion 360 that allows you to create any shape that you want and then use this solid model to subtract all of the different spaces in between the parts and it creates all of the interlocking parts for you. It's a really cool process. He has a whole video on how he did it, so go check that out if you're really interested. So I went ahead and I purchased that model from him on his website and I'm gonna use that in this project. My biggest challenge with this project so far is being able to fit everything I need to in the small amount of space as possible. I know that I make a lot of big things, like I made the big Arduino board and the big Raspberry Pi board. My goal is not to make every project like a giant sized thing, and that was definitely not the goal with this project, but it's starting to shape up that way because of the constraints I have inside this cube. I need to fit motors and I need to fit motor controllers and a battery and all sorts of different things in here. And it's just making this thing bigger and bigger and bigger. I didn't want that to happen, but I think I've settled on a scale that allows me to fit everything inside without it interfering with the pieces of the cube. I'm gonna be making this five times the size of a normal Rubik's Cube. Before we get too far into this project, I wanna tell you about the sponsor of this video and that's Altium. If you're like me, you're constantly working on projects that involve electronics. Maybe you're making an Arduino project or maybe a Raspberry Pi project or some sort of IoT thing, or maybe you're making a robot. You're gonna need a circuit board for that project. And in order to design that PCB, you're gonna want to use a reliable PCB design software. And that's why I'm recommending Altium Designer. What I like about Altium Designer is that it's an all-in-one platform. That means that you don't have to open up separate programs to do your schematic capture or your component selection or your board layout and your netlist generation. It's all in one platform. If you want to get serious about making PCBs, there's a link in the description where you can get a free trial of Altium Designer. When you download that free trial of Altium, you're also going to discover one of the other features that I like, 
and that's Altium 365. Altium 365 is a cloud workspace that allows you to save your project files in the cloud. That means that you can collaborate with other people, you could work on various machines without losing your work. A whole team of engineers can be collaborating and reviewing the same project because it's cloud-based. So here's what you need to do. Go down in the description and click on the link and that will give you a free trial to Altium Designer. You're going to install it and open it up and start playing around with it and start placing components and then routing your traces and you're going to see how easy it is to use. After you're done playing around with the trial, you're going to go back in the description and click on the second link which will give you a 30% discount when you decide to buy a license. Thank you for supporting sponsors like Altium and thank you to Altium for supporting my channel. As I said earlier, I ordered six of these motors, one for each of the axis of the Rubik's Cube. Now because it's close to the holidays and I ordered these from Amazon, shipping is crazy right now. I've only received three out of the six. My Amazon account says I should have the remaining three delivered today, so hopefully that's the case. But while we're waiting for the other three to get here, I'm going to take a minute and talk about how encoders work, and I'm going to show you using the oscilloscope. To turn on one of these motors is really simple. You just apply a voltage to the positive and negative terminals on the motor, and it'll start to spin. I've got a five volt power supply hooked up here that's providing power to both the motor and the encoder. The way that an encoder works is that this wheel has a magnet on it and as it spins around it gets close to the Hall effect sensor which can detect the magnetic field. So let's look at these signals here on the oscilloscope. Right now I only have one of the output signals of the encoder connected to the oscilloscope. So if I zoom in here you can see this nice beautiful square wave. Having one Hall effect sensor is great if you just need to know how fast the motor is spinning, but if you need to know which direction it's spinning, you need two Hall effect sensors. Let's go ahead and connect up the second output signal from the encoder and see what that looks like. The reason it's called a quadrature encoder is because there are four different states in which the two outputs can be. Off, 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 on, on, off, and on, on. So you can see that the first signal is still here on the bottom in this light blue color, and the second signal is this kind of magenta color. The other clever part of a quadrature encoder design is that the outputs are not in phase. They're offset by 90 degrees. That means that the rising edge of signal A is offset from the rising edge of signal B. Based on this information, you can tell which way the motor is spinning, whether the rising edge of A is first or the rising edge of B is first. So the way you'd read this is you'd connect these two output signals to a microcontroller, and in order to measure the speed of the motor, you would just time how long it takes to go between one rising edge to the next rising edge. So in this case, right now my motor is spinning counterclockwise, and I can see that the magenta leading edge is coming just before the blue leading edge. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit more. Now if I were to switch the polarity of the motor, we're going to see that the blue edge will come before the magenta edge. I'm going to plug it back in, and now the motor is spinning clockwise. So you can see now that the blue leading edge comes before the magenta leading edge. So that's how you would use a quadrature encoder and a microcontroller to tell which direction and how fast a motor is spinning. Now I'm going to head over to the 3D printer and start printing out the pieces I need for the core of the Rubik's Cube. I finally got the rest of the six motors I need to start assembling this project. As ridiculous as this sounds, each of these six motors came individually on different days wrapped in individual packages. So I don't know what their fulfillment center was doing, but it was definitely not the most efficient way to get six motors to me. Last night I set the 3D printer up to go overnight, which I do all the time, and I've never really had major problems, but this morning I went in to check on it, and here's what I found. Here is what I walked into, just a complete solid chunk of filament. This is cooled down and just completely gummed up the entire print head. Um, this is the little uh, silicon shroud that goes over the, the heated nozzle. Um, this, is a, this is a disaster. I'm going to have to heat everything up, 
let it melt off and then get everything cleaned up and start this print again. Man, that sucks. This is so bad. It is, it is caked on there. It is totally stuck. I don't know what I'm gonna do here. It's already heated up and it's still not coming off. It's, I'm gonna have to start probably snipping it away with some tools. Gosh, I don't wanna break anything off. It's just like totally solid, solid block of filament. It's not even like stringy, it's like, it's like it was like an injection molded part that just got crammed into a space and completely solidified. I really don't want to snap off like the little extruder block. Getting my first real good look at how bad the damage is. Look at that. It's like molten lava just solidified in the rock. I tried for a few minutes to use this heat gun to kind of warm up and loosen that glob of plastic, but it didn't do any good. So I'm just going to take it off and hopefully that'll make it easier to, to fix this and clean it all up. I was finally able to get the blob of 3D printing filament off the print head. What I ended up doing was putting the print head back on the machine and preheating the nozzle. Then I waited for the massive PLA to kind of heat up and I slowly wiggled it off. Unfortunately, in the process, I damaged the auto bed leveling sensor. And this particular machine uses this as the Z limit switch. So I can't get this machine to print anything until I fix that sensor. So I'm waiting for a replacement sensor in the mail. So unfortunately, this machine's out of commission for now. But luckily I have a second 3D printer that is continuing to print parts in the background as I work on this problem. With that being said, unfortunately, I'm gonna have to split this project into two videos. In the next video, I'm gonna finish printing up all these cube pieces, then I'm gonna have to install the battery and the power switch and wire up all the motor controllers and finish assembling this cube. Then I'll need to write code on the microcontroller for all of the self-solving stuff, so there's still a ton of work to do on this project. Be sure to join me in the next video to watch the conclusion of the self-solving Rubik's Cube. I make a lot of other project videos like this. In fact, I've put together a playlist that you can click on here of all the project videos that I think you'd like. If you're new to Bite Size, be sure to click that subscribe button so you can keep up to date with all the projects that I'm working on. Thanks for taking the time to watch this one. I'll see you next time.